right, I uh, suppose we can get started. So, pleased to introduce to you today Christopher Karoff from uh, Aarhus University. Got his uh, PhD there, and uh, after a stint of uh, postdocs at the University of Birmingham and also Aarhus, he mo recently became uh, associate professor there at the Department of Geoscience uh, and the Department of Physics and Astronomy at, at Aarhus. And his research field is on stellar structure and evolution. Characteristics of exoplanets, the Sun-Earth connection, climate, astroseismology, magnetic fields, rotation, and convection. All things which uh, many of us here have a great interest. So uh, I'll let you get started. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Vicky. Can you hear me? It's working? Yes. Good. Okay. Uh, yes. Thank, me. Thank you for inviting me to give this talk. So the title of the talk is Other Effects of Stellar Dynamos. And, and Reiner just asked, so what are the first effects? So the first effect of, of, of the solar dynamo is the 11-year cycle. And I'm not going to say so much that today. I have a short outline here for what the talk is going to include. Uh, so I will present some observations from a Chinese telescope called the MOST uh, that I will then use to analyze rotation, astroseismology, exoplanets, superflares, and the magnetic greenhouse effect. Uh, so that will be the first and the main part of the talk. And then by the end, because I'm here where there are so many people who are experts in solar and stellar dynamo, I will present some of my own personal hand-waving ideas about dynamos. Good. So the reason why I'm here, apart from giving this talk, is to uh, collaborate with Rick and Phil and others on combining observations from the uh, Mount Wilson and the Lowell observatories. Uh, and that's how we used to seeing stellar activity measurements from these two observatories. What we will see about today will come from this telescope in China, uh, the Gongxuning telescope, also called the MOST, um, which have surveyed a large fraction of the sky and specifically as I looked at the Kepler field so this is the field observed by the Kepler satellite you see the CCD, the different CCDs here and then you see 14 different pointings of this telescope uh, so it's, it's uh, a different telescope from what you used to seeing so the lenses are here and then you have uh, so the, the mirror is here and then you have the instrument sitting up here which is a uh, spectrograph <coughs> with around 4,000 fibers attached to it. So in each of these uh, uh, pointings, you can do 4,000 um, uh, stars at once. And doing multiple observations within each pointing in order to take stars at different magnitude level, uh, the most were able to observe uh, around 100,000 stars in the Kepler field. Uh, and these are the first results. Uh, number of spectra for three different stars. So you have one star that are sun-like, and then you have a star that is hotter and a star that is cooler. And what I'm interested in looking at today are these two lines here, so the calcium H and K line. Now, these spectra are, of course, one of the ni some of the nicest spectra we have observed with mo the most. Uh, and, and when I first got involved in this, I didn't really thought it would be possible to measure stellar activity with this telescope. Uh, one of the problems is that this telescope only have a, uh, the spectrograph only have a resolution about uh, 1,800, 1800, 1,800, compared to the spectrograph they use at the Lowell Observatory, which have a resolution of around 10,000. So you go down a factor of over five in resolution, and the signal to noise of these spectra, or the main part of the spectra, is also very pure. So usually when we, when we measure still activity, we would like to see in the blue part of the spectra a signal to noise of maybe not 100, but, but close to 100. The main part of, of, of the spectra I've been looking at have a signal to noise of uh, just over five. 
But as I hope I can convince you today, uh, these observations are still very useful. And the reason why they're useful is that though you have pure resolution, though you have pure signal to noise, and that means that you will get large uncertainties on your measurement, the thing is that you have so many stars means that you can do statistical studies on, on these observations. So these are old examples uh, from Jeff Linsky about the calcium 8 and K line uh, from stars that are gradually getting hotter. And you see some of these stars, I think stand over here, and some of these stars have uh, great emission in the middle of the calcium 8 and K line. And I'm sure many of you are very well aware of this, that you can use that to measure uh, activity in these stars. So here's, a, here's another old figure where uh, Schreiber and others have compared two observations of uh, the calcium K line taken of the sun, the quiet sun, and taken of a plat region in, on the sun's solar surface. So doing resolved observation on the solar surface. And when you do that, you see that you have a very clear peak in the middle of the calcium K line when you observe a region with strong magnetic fields, a plasma region on the sun. And this is how it looks when you look at these plasma regions. So this is the photosphere that we are used to seeing with dark sunspots. When you look in the UV light or the calcium K line, uh, you see these plasma regions in the chromosphere, and so that's what you really measuring when you measure stellar activity with the calcium H and K line. You measure the plasma in the chromosphere, and I will come back to why why that's uh, important when we are to compare these observations to other measurements. So here are again four examples of calcium H and K line uh, in stars that I've measured uh, from. Uh, from the must. Uh, so when we measure uh, this chromospheric activity, we use something called the S-index, which measure the amount of flux in a one angstrom uh, band here, actually a triangular band pass and triangular band pass here, and then divided by some reference band pass out here. Uh, and here you see four different stars with increasing uh, activity level as you go up. So these have been artificially shifted upwards in order to, to show him. And I hope I can convince you that you start seeing filling in in the middle of these lines. Uh, so that's how it looks with the most. Uh, for, I mean, spectra in, in the better signal to noise range. It can look worse for other stars, but it can also look, look better. So these are the stars I looked at. So 100,000 stars in the Kepler field that was observed by Lamost. And you see the uh, HR diagram. Where's the speaker? You see the HR diagram of uh, these 100,000 stars here. So here I take input values from what's called the Kepler input catalog. So we have the effective temperature and the surface gravity, uh, which so this was done by Tim Brown. So, so I think the, the precision is as good as it was possible at that time, but it's, 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 it's not infinite. Uh, and I also show a division I did between main sequence stars and uh, giant stars, sort of an artificial division, but I, I use that for later on. So this is figures from a study uh, on super players that I will show later on that was just accepted by Nature Communication last week. So here are uh, the measurements. Um, I got uh, spectra that were good enough for, for, for where I dare to present these measurements in, in almost uh, 75,000 stars. And here again you see the black are the main sequence stars, and in red are the giant stars. Um, and uh, one of the things that you want to look for is the division between active and inactive stars by this uh, Wangham Preston gap. Uh, I was not able to, I haven't been able to see that gap so far. Uh, that should be sort of around here. Um, I need to look into that, but it could be a color dependent thing or something like that. 
uh, it's probably because of, of the limit precision that I cannot see the gap, if it's there. I mean, there have been other studies that have failed to see this gap, uh, especially when you just look at the SFX. But you see a clear division between uh, giant stars and main sequence stars. And I mean, um, normally you would say that the, the the giant stars or the subgiant stars uh, do not have strong chromosphere, so you should be very carefully with, with actually using the S index uh, for, for giant and subgiant stars. So uh, I, I don't do that, except for a last study where I, I tried to do it and it didn't work out, but I will come back to that. So the position, so around uh, 30, so this are, these are this is first the signal to noise in the spectra, uh, uh, these uh, 75,000 spectra as a function of, of effective temperature. Again, in red, you see the cool giant stars, and in black, you see the main sequence stars. And you see that most of them have a signal to noise of, well, close to zero, but around one or something like that. Uh, but there are over 30,000 main sequence stars and six and a half thousand giant evolved stars that have a signal to noise over five. And uh, I'm going to, to warn you that the figures I will show from now on use different cuts in temperature and uh, uh, signal to noise. And the problem is, of course, if you go down to lower signal to noise, you get more measurement but lower precision. And again, if you, with temperature, if you just look at the temperature range of the sun, uh, you probably have an easier way to compare to the sun, but you have less stars. Uh, but I will try to, to keep you up on what are the criteria here. So for these observations I have, there are around 30,000 stars that have been observed in multiple pointing by the most. So that means that I have a number of spectra for these stars where I can measure the S index in and I can then look at the standard deviation of these different measurements and compare that to the signal to noise ratio. And you can sort of see a relation here. Uh, at least that's, that's the best thing I can do in order to estimate the signal to noise on these S, uh, S index measurement I have. So the measurement of the chromospheric emission. Um, and I started out in the first study to use a cutoff here at a signal to noise of 10. So that means that I will only look down the stars here. And then when I started to look at rotation and exoplanets, I realized that it was probably better to go up a little more higher up here. Uh, that made the, the statistical analysis more significant. Another thing I did in order to test if, if if I was actually measuring the right thing was to compare my observations of chromospheric emission, the S index, with uh, other observations that, have, that exist in the literature. And one of the studies was done by uh, Yusa Natsu from Japan, who have also looked at super flares and measured the chromospheric emission, not in the ultraviolet calcium emission K line, but in the infrared uh, calcium line. Uh, and I can compare my measurement of the same stars to his measurement. And within the error bars, I think there's a relatively nice correlation here. That sort of assure me that, that, that the right track here for measuring chromospheric emission. OK, so now on to the results. So this was a short introduction um, to, to the observations. Um, so first on rotation. So I know that this is probably not other effects of, of dynamos, but it's, it's the first thing you want to do when you have such a data set. How does it compare to rotation? And this study of the relation between rotation and chromospheric emission was pioneered by noise in, in 84. And here you see the relation between not the S index, but the R prime index, which is basically the S index corrected for, for a color firm, and then the uh, rotation period. And you see some sort of relation here with the sun down here as one of the ones with the lowest emission and, and longest rotation period. I can do the same thing uh, for the Kepler stars and 
luckily, I can use observations from other of the rotation periods. There have been a number of studies of rotation periods in, in Kepler light curves. So here I present uh, two studies, one from Martin Bo Nielsen, uh, who measured rotation period up to a, uh, sort of like the solar rotation period. And then I can compare my observation of the S-index to his uh, uh, rotation measurement. And now, so the black points you see in the background are uh, stars with uh, temperatures below what's called the craft break at 6,200 Kelvin. So the craft break is, is like where you say that the con outer convective zone gets so thin uh, that you don't expect significant uh, magnetic, mag magnetic breaking or dynamo action for stars hotter than that. Uh, so the black points are stars with signal to noise higher than uh, 5, and the red points are then with the stars with signal to noise higher than 40. And it's not easy to see a correlation, uh, but maybe you can convince yourself that there is sort of correlation. Uh, McQuillan did a study where he went up to much longer rotation period, uh, and Again, it's not easy to see a correlation, but, but, but it might be there. Now, uh, noise did another. Yes? Yes? So these, so, so the S index are the same observations. Stronger than here. I mean, you, you have to note that the scale changes here as well. But but I think you're right. That that there's a stronger correlation with the McQuillan results than with the, the Nielsen results. And why is that? Is it the same data? Um, it's two different methods for for measuring the rotation period. So uh, McQuillan uses um, an outer correlation function. Uh, Martin used so Martin was actually my master student, used a method where he, he calculated a periodic gram and then calculated a rotation period for each uh, quarter of Kepler observation and then looked at that. And um, I, I have to say I trust these the most, not just because <laughs> I was part of doing it, but there was a hair and hound analysis where, uh, organized by Susan Orgrain where they compared that. And I mean, it appeared that, that, that Martin and his analysis was spot on all the time, which that was not the case for, for, for all of us. Um, so, is that because, uh, Nielsen was the fact that uh, limited lifetimes of yes, yes. But I'm, I mean, if you go back to the noise result, you don't have a perfect correlation here either. So, so. Um, Okay, the next thing you want to do is what, what Robert Noyes also did, not to look at the rotation period, but to look at what's called the Rosby number, uh, where you divide the period by the convective turnover time or by some sort of convective turnover time. By fiddling a little bit around with how you define the convective turnover time, he arrived at this very, very strong, very nice uh, correlation. I can do the same thing, and, and the problem is here that, that I need uh, effective temperatures to calculate the convective turnover time. And I only have the effective temperature from the Kepler input catalog, which, as many of you know, are far from perfect. So, so I'm adding noise sort of here. Uh, but I think you see the same thing. The correlation gets stronger. It doesn't get perfect. Uh, and I haven't actually statistically measured which one is the best correlation. But, but I would tend to see that this one is stronger again. So I would see I only see a limit correlation between the rotation period and, and the chromatic emission. But where I do see a strong correlation is if I look at the amplitude of the photometric variability over a rotation period. So again, these are not my own measurements. These are measurements from McQuillan, uh, where uh, he simply look at the standard deviation over a 
a rotation period and then take a mean of all the standard deviation over a rotation period and then arrive at this index R prime. And now I think the, the correlation gets somewhat uh, stronger. At least down to sort of where you, you hit a viability of around a thousand part per million. And that's also the viability you have in the sun. I mean, if we just look at the stars here, I'm not sure I see a correlation. Uh, so, so I would say that this correlation exists for, uh, uh, for uh, viability over rotation period that is larger than what we see in the sun. Good. I will now move on to astroseismology. Um, as, as, as many of you are aware, uh, with astroseismology on the Kepler data, we can measure interesting parameters like age and mass and radius. Uh, and it's, of course, interesting to see how these compared uh, to stellar activity measurements. Uh, but the results are not so great. So here are, uh, I compare my measurement of the S index uh, to measurement of stellar ages by uh, Bill Chaplin. Um, so, so Bill led a large work where uh, we used what's called the large frequency separation to give estimates of mass, radius, and uh, ages uh, for around 800 stars, and a significant number of them I've measured the S index for. Travis have updated this study for, for 42 stars, and that looks much better. But I mean, given the limit position on uh, the age here, and I've not even dared to draw the error bars on the S index here, I cannot see a correlation here. I can do the same thing for the mass, and the result is the same. I cannot see a strong correlation between S index and the mass. I strongly believe that this is not because there's no correlation there, it's simply because the measurements are not precise enough to, to search for this. I about the index, about the of the exactly. I can, however, ever see another very interesting thing, uh, and this is shown in this figure, and I'm going to show you a, a, a number of these histograms um, where I show the S index on the x-axis, and then I have a, the relative fraction of here, and in black, I have the curve of, so here is, is all the uh, sun-like main sequence stars that have been observed by both Kepler and the MUST. So this is generally the distribution of sun-like stars. Uh, the blue here, I have the range of the sun over a solar cycle, how it changes its S index. And then in red, I have the targets where we can do astroseismology on. And what is clear here is that the astroseismic targets uh, are somehow shifted to lower S index. Or at least there's a tra trail here of, of stars with large chromospheric emission that is missing in the astrocyte sample. And that agrees completely with what we would expect, because we know over uh, a solar cycle, when we have large uh, magnetic activity in the sun, the amplitude of the p-mode oscillations in the sun get lower by something like 50%. And we've shown the same as the, the case for, for, for the sun-like stars observed by Kepler, when they show large photometric viability, uh, that means we believe that that's caused by a number of spots on the surface of these stars, uh, we are less likely to detect an astroseismic signal. So simply that, that the stars with the most active stars are so active that, that the, the oscillations amplitude are, are, are suppressed so much that we don't see any signal. This one? Yeah. No. Uh, sure, that's uh, worth looking into. So this, this should somehow be an outlier when you look at the relation between amplitude and, and evolution state. Yeah. Good. Then I move on to exoplanets. Uh, and this is a nice animation I like to show here about the known planets. Um, I believe that most of you heard about the nine planets in the solar system uh, a week ago or something like that. So this animation shows the number of known planets we have known. So we begin up with the planets in the solar system. Um, 
and you actually see uh, at some states, I think it was Vega that was counted as a as a planet, uh, and Pluto is of course also counted as a planet here. Then it later on disappeared. But what you of course see is that when we get up into the 90s, uh, this figure here starts to be populated enormously by uh, the exoplanets that we discover. And when we get past 2010, we have all the Kepler detection and, and we have planets everywhere. And then, therefore, it's of course uh, interesting to see if there's in anything peculiar about stars with planets when you measure the chromospheric emission compared to stars that do not have planets. So, um, Now, the problem is that, that Kepler has detected, uh, detected something like around 1,000 planets, confirmed planets. And then it has planetary candidates, which are known as these Kepler objects of interest. There are over 4,000 of these. Um, so when I only look at the confirmed planets, uh, there are so few planets that I don't really see a result. So here I look at all the, the planetary candidates instead. And I think that's, that's sort of a common practice that, that you can look at them and, and then say, OK, a given fraction of these ones will turn out to be uh, planets in the end. But as we'll come back to it, it's a bit problematic to assume that here. So I can compare the orbital period of, of these planetary candidates to the S-index. Um, and in red, we then have, have the confirmed planets. Uh, and I don't know if you can see a relation there. I mean, maybe you have a region up here where you have planets with long periods, which, uh, where you don't have planets with long periods, which host stars with, with high chromospheric emission. And I think the reason for that is that if the stars are very active, they are too noisy for us to see small or planets in long orbits. Um, I can also look at uh, a subset of these uh, 234 Kepler object interests that have measured rotation period and then look at the relation between the orbital period and the rotation period and then the color coding gives the amount of chromospheric emission. So hotter color means uh, stronger chromospheric emission. And uh, what you maybe tend to see there is that if you draw a line here, that would be the synchronized planet. So that means planets that, that have an orbital period that equals the rotation period of the star. And if such a system are synchronized, you could expect there will be some interaction between the star and the planet. And maybe there's a tendency that the stars that fall on this line here are, are warmer, so have stronger chromospheric emission. It's especially interesting to look at the hot Jupiters. That's what I do here. Uh, and then red, I've marked the known hot Jupiters um, and the, the black ones. So in, in red, we have, no, in red, we have the stars that are marked as hot Jupiters, known hot Jupiters. Uh, and you see at least a, a few that fall on, on this, this line here. Now, what, what does show something if, is when I do the same histogram as I did for the uh, astroseismic subset before. Uh, and the reason for that is, of course, that doing the histogram, you, you take advantage of, you have so many stars, and you take advantage of that you can do a statistical analysis. So in black, you can see sun-like stars, the distribution of the S-index of these stars. In blue, you see the range of the sun. In red, you see all the stars that have planets. And you can see that they follow the general distribution. So in general, stars that have planets do not show different chromospheric emission from stars that don't have planets. But if I look at the hot Jupiters, I can actually see that they tend to be shifted to larger values of the S-index. Um, it depends a little bit on, I mean, the threshold you use for the signal to noise, uh, the temperature range you look at, but, but all, for all the choices I do, I see a tendency for, for them to be shifted over to higher activity levels. So the, you can see the error bars here. 
uh, are made from the counting statistic in each spin. So for the black curve, I have a very good counting statistic. For the hot Jupiters, uh, it's, it's not so great. They're around 30. Did I wrote that down? 30 hot Jupiters in this sample here. Um, now, if, if this is really a result, it's a very interesting result. People have been using a lot of, lot of energy to prove that uh, hot Jupiter host stars are more magnetic active than, than other stars. Uh, but I'm not completely, well, there, there's a number of possibilities that I cannot rule out here. And the first one is because I only look at planetary candidates here, uh, the reason could be that some of these hot Jupiter candidates are not hot Jupiters, but are cool stars. So you have a D-type stars that are being orbited by an early M-type star. Or you have a diluted binary with a system where you have an early M-type star. And we know that M-type stars tend to be more active than, than um, D and, and K-type stars, and therefore they could shift these values over to a uh, larger level of magnetic activity. Um, so I haven't been able to rule that possibility out. I mean, you would have to go and confirm all these before you can do that. Uh, but if I compare the number of expected false, false positive uh, and look at, at the stars that are known by us and something like that, uh, I think I can argue that, that the result is still sort of significant. If it is significant, there's a number of different mechanisms that can explain it too. One could be that hot Jupiters tend to orbit young stars. I mean that the hot Jupiters are formed by some sort of migration mechanism that will eventually cause the hot Jupiters to, to merge into the star. And that means that, that we, will only, we will tend to see more hot Jupiters around young, young stars than older stars. And therefore, hot Jupiter host stars would tend to be more active than other stars. Another thing could be tidal interaction. So tidal interaction have been suggested as a formation mechanism for hot Jupiters. Um, that they are formed uh, longer out in the, the planetary system and then migrate in uh, through some sort of, of tidal mechanism. That can explain why a large fraction of these hot Jupiters have uh, what's called large obligates. So there's a, so for the solar system, all the stars in the solar system are more or less aligned with the rotation axis of the sun, or it's tilted by seven degrees, but more or less aligned. When we look at the hot Jupiter system, we see them having all sort of obligates, uh, and that could maybe be explained by tidal interaction, and. These tidal interactions could also somehow lead to increased chromospheric emission in these stars. And that possibility is that the Jupiters can somehow enhance the magnetic activity of the host stars. Uh, I don't think anybody knows exactly how. There are a number of, of suggestions for them. Uh, one suggestion is that, that um, um, the hot Jupiters can sort of force the star to co-rotate with them, um, or at least the outer part of the stars to co-rotate co with them. Uh, so, so the idea is there that you will have some sort of decoupling of the outer layer of the star. Uh, so the inner part will rotate. The inner part where you have most of the mass will rotate more or less how it used to, and then the outer part will be synchronized with the uh, hot Jupiter. Um, and, and some sort of evidence is found for this when you look at the sun, where you have these, when you look at the outer 5% of the sun, you have these enormous uh, change in radi uh, radial uh, differential rotation, so the radial shear layer. And if that's the case for the, for the, um, for other stars too, with a hot Jupiter, there might be enough energy in the hot Jupiter rotation to change the rotation of this outer part of the stars. Um, so, if the result is significant, there's a number of ways that, that, that can be used to explain this result. Uh, I can do the same thing for what I then call small planets. 
so basically, that's that's all the planets that are uh, smaller than the, the hot Jupiters. And uh, again, in black, we have all the stars. In red, we have the stars with planets. And then in green, we have the one with small planets. And uh, I hope I can convince you here that I see a defect in the uh, small planet host stars with high, with large level of chromospheric emission. Um, and again, that can be explained by the fact that if a star is very active, it's very noisy, and we will not see small planets. And as it was for the astrocytic example, there will then be a, a, a wing here of, of large activity that we will not see. This is, this is not as significant as it was for the hot Jupiters. OK, on to super flares. So Kepler have detected a number of uh, so-called super flares. So uh, something that in the light curve looked like what we see for the sun. Uh, so this would more or less look like an X-ray light curve of the sun doing a flare. But this is in white light, so it's, it's many magnitude larger than what we see in the sun. This is a study I did a few years ago using short cadence data. You see a huge flare here, and you actually see a number of smaller flares later on. It's interesting to measure this because here I looked at the astroseismic subsample of Kepler stars. Uh, so there are the crosses, and then the diamonds are the amount of these stars where I found super flares in. Um, and this is interesting because you see that there are actually some evolved stars where I do see super flares in. And here, the effective temperature and surface gravity are not from the Kepler input catalog, but are the astroseismic measurement. So there's no, there's no doubt that these stars are evolved stars. I mean, the position on the surface gravity is something like 0 0.03 dex or something like that, isn't it? Sort of give and take. But um, if we thought that, that flares or super flares something that we saw on young stars or sun-like stars, it's not true. We do also see them on subgiant stars. I do the same histogram now for the stars that have super flares. So these are not the super flares I looked at in the astroseismic subsample, but uh, are the super flares that the Japanese group found by looking at all the Kepler long cadence data. And again, in black, you see all the stars. You see the sun. And then in red, you see the uh, stars with super flares. And this is clear that that sample is shifted to higher uh, S indexes. It's beautiful. It's a six, six sigma results. So with six sigma significance, this is shifted to higher values. Um, so I think this can be interpreted as I mean, when, when, when people first saw these super flares with Kepler, uh, it was not clear what we were looking at. I mean, we saw something that looked like we see what we see on the sun, but it was just five order of magnitude larger. That means it was not clear there was the same mechanism. Uh, so the mechanism that caused the flare in the sun, you know much better than I do, is it's like uh, chromospheric or coronal reconnection of, of magnetic field lines. It was the same mechanism that caused these super flares. It's a measurement of the emission in the calcium H and K line. Uh, so, so it measures chromospheric emission, sort of. Yes? And I mean, of course, there, there, there will be other stars that show super flares. But I mean, given the three-year light curve or something we have from Kepler, only these stars show super flares. I mean, some of them are flaring constantly, having these super flares. Some of them only show one or two. Yes? Yes. 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 Um, I think. 
all of them show dark spots. I mean, the, so the Japanese found uh, three, four hundred superflare stars, and of these, I have is in the measurement of forty. And I think all these 48 stars had a measured rotation period because you could see dark spots. Uh, which is not the case if you take out random stars. Then the probability that you can measure a rotation period is 50% or something like that. Um, Uh, so for this is is not that low because you look at long cadence data, uh, so you only have a sampling of, of half an hour. Uh, exactly on a later slide, so two seconds. So here we have the lower limit is ten to the thirty-three Earths. Uh, if you use the short cadence data, and there have been a study by Matea. Uh, who look at the salt cadence data, you could go on to lower energies too. Okay, so, so this would suggest that uh, the origin of superflares is somehow magnetic, and in order to have a superflares, it would be better to have a larger magnetic field than sun like stars in general, and like the sun. Lots of magnetic energy than the sun. However, there are a handful of superflare stars which have S indexes that are lower than what we see in the sun. So though it's unlikely that we will see a, a superflare on a like complete solar twin, it's, it's, it's not impossible. However, if we look at not just superflares with energies higher than 10 to the 33 Earls, but superflares higher with energies higher than uh, 2 times 10 to the 34. That's the green curve. Then we remove this trail of uh, low chromospheric emission stars. So they can somehow cause superflares, but not the really strong one of them. So the way, the blue uh, follow-up. Yes. Uh, Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, just to show that, that that I can also calibrate this to what's called chromospheric flux. So this is not the S index, but an index almost identical to R prime. It was uh, the recipe for calculating that was was developed lately by uh, a German group led by uh, Mitzak. Uh, now when I do this, I add in the effective temperature from the Kepler input catalog so they get more noisy, but the result is still the same. You can also calculate something called F prime uh, just to, to test that you can use different calibration for this. Now, I can use this to sort of predict the likelihood that the sun will experience a superflare. And you can do that by um, showing these power law relations between flares at different energy and the uh, occurrence of frequencies of these flares. So the solid line are from observed solar flares, but you see it's more likely to observe a low energy solar flare than a high energy solar flare. The dotted line are from the Kepler stars in general, so you look at uh, simply uh, all the superflares you have detected at different energies, compare that to how many stars you have observed for how long, and then you get this power law relation here. Um, but that's, of course, for all stars, but all rotation period, all activity levels. You now say, okay, I look only at stars which have uh, activity levels like the sun or lower. Uh, you get a different relation here. And that's the dashed line with some sort of, of, of uncertainty measurement on it. Um, and then you can see that the chance of getting these superflares, of course, get lower. 
uh, especially for the one with high energy, so it actually stops over here. Uh, the color coding shows the blue, where you can expect one such flare each year, in green each decade, in yellow each century, and in red each millennia. Um, and so you can actually see by, by including this, uh, by taking into account the chromospheric emission, you go from one of these, you would expect one of these super flares each decade to each uh, century. Um, and this actually makes uh, a nicer agreement with results from the count. Uh, so you can go in and look at, at ice cores or tree rings and see how many uh, what's called solar magnetic particle events have we seen here on Earth. Uh, and that seems to agree reasonably up here, but when we get down to the high energy, we don't see any. Uh, and therefore, people talk about a roll-off in this distribution here. This diamond here represents uh, an event that was found recently by the uh, by a Japanese group. Uh, they looked at, at some tree rings and found a, a peak event in 775. Uh, recently, it was found another event in 994. And if you add these two events together, you say that the, the, the chance of getting such an event is one every 620 years, and then you arrive at a dot here. So that means that if you should continue this for, for the sunlight case, uh, it would probably look something like this. I mean, it would roll over here. And so by including the chromospheric measurement, measurement you have brought a large agreement between the stellar measurement and the ground measurement. Good. The magnetic greenhouse effect, uh, it was a nice result that were, came out a few months ago, uh, where uh, people had looked at oscillation giants and found what they call a, uh, a suppression of the amplitude of dipole mode uh, and they suggested that this could be caused by magnetic fields inside these uh, giant stars. And I mean, the way I understand this is that, that um, this, these magnetic fields inside the stars would cancel out uh, symmetrical modes, and therefore you would not see a dipole mode as strongly. And when they looked at all the giant stars in general, they saw some stars have dipole modes, as you would expect and some have suppressed dipole modes, which they suggest could then be caused by a magnetic field. Of course, this is in the interior. And of course, as I said, you should not use this S-index to look at giants with, but I dare to do it anyway. Uh, so now, the distribution have been moved out to the other side of the sun. The giants tend to be less active than, um, than the sun. And um, in black, you see 364 stars without suppressed dipole modes, so they're the ones that are not expected to have large internal magnetic fields, and in which you see 115 with suppressed dipole modes, which are expected to have, or which could have, uh, large internal magnetic fields. And I do not see any different. Uh, I'm not sure if you expect it, but, but at least I checked that I do not see it. OK, before I finish up, I want to, to, to come up with, with some uh, ideas about dynamos that this and other work have led me to come up with. And, and I mean, these ideas are very hand-waving. I have, how long? OK, five, 10 minutes or something? Five minutes, yes. Um, they're, they're very hand-waving. And it might be completely wrong, but, but I like to present it to you because I know some of you know a lot about, much more about dynamos than I do. Uh, so this is sort of like dynamos from an perspective. So you know the Skumani law, the relation between um, uh, rotation period, calcium emission, and uh, lithium abundancy. You know the vulcan preston gap that I talked about before, where you have uh, a group here of uh, very active stars and a larger group of inactive stars. Um, so these are things that a dynamo 
theory should be able to explain. Uh, but then there was, and then of course the the Buen-Vitense diagram, uh, which at least I know I've showed you here before, and, and people have seen here before, the relation between rotation period and uh, cycle period, where you see an active branch and an inactive branch. And then a few weeks ago, was a very very interesting result by Jennifer Van Salens, Salers, which Travis is part of, which shows that, that this doesn't seem to apply to stars that are older than the sun. Then when you have very precise measurement of stellar ages from astro seismology, you can show that stars that are older than the sun tend to rotate faster than what is predicted by the Skumani law and what's called gyrotonality. Um, so this here is the relation for gyrotonality between ages and rotation period. Here we have the sun, and then we have this clump of stars that are older than the sun that do not follow this relation. The uh, the Skumani law was uh, explained uh, in the 80s by Mistel and Steve Fowler and uh, Martin uh, where they came up with, with relations like this for the evolution of the angular momentum. And when you look at these relations, there is this in parameter which they call the wind index. And it's clear that this wind index is different if you have different um, configuration of the global magnetic field of these stars. So for a radial field, you have an n equal 2. For dipole fields, this can change a little bit from which paper you look at, because the, uh, uh, the, the, the way you describe this can change a little bit. Um, if you have a dipole field, it's, it's, it's 3 or 7. Um, and if you have a quadrupolar field, it's, it's even different. And sort of that's sort of my suggestion. This was this is the work that I'm often looking at ice core measurement of solar activity done by uh, one of my former PhD students, Fatil Exolulu, who looked at the solar activity 7,700 years back in time. So. Um, we are up here, and then we go back in time here. Uh, now, where are we? Yes, we must be up here, and then we go back in time. These are ice core trillings, so they don't go all the way up to today. But the thing is that you see periods that you can classify as low activity periods, like mountain minimum periods, and periods of high activity that you can classify at, as maximum periods. And uh, the reason for this has been suggested that uh, at um, activity maximum period, you have a dipole, dipole uh, mode of the dynamo that is stronger than the quadrupolar mode that you have at minimum periods. So simply to say that whenever you are in an activity maximum, uh, the dominating mode of the dynamo is dipolar. Whereas whenever you are uh, in activity minimum, the dominant mode is quadrupolar. Yes? The uh, solar mass flux, right? Yes? Yes? Yes. So, so. Yes. Um. I I don't know the answer to that. Uh, but let, let let me try to go on to to to. I mean, you might see where I'm getting here. But but the thing is that you will have a different evolution of the angular momentum at. Uh, grand maxima that you will have at grand minima. And that means that with a quadrupolar configuration of the 
magnetic field, and using this uh, description of the evolution of the magnetic of the angular momentum uh, developed by the crawler, you would lose less angular momentum at uh, activity minimum periods, and that means that you would no longer see this uh, Schumann evolution, but you would see something else. Yes. There are some people doing uh, mean field diamond models that suggest that this could be a cause of, of the grand minima. Uh, there's nothing in the data that I can use to prove that this is the case. Uh, I have some idea for how to test it, but I haven't made it there yet. And, and, and if you have an idea about how to test it, I would like to hear it. Anyway, this is hand waving, but just, I mean, if you, you put this into an equation, you could maybe end up with something that looked more like this. And that Okay, another thing that, 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 uh, that agrees with this picture, it doesn't prove it, but it agrees, are the rotation measurement by McQuillan, where, so these are rotation measurement of over 30,000 Kepler stars as a function of mass, and it seems that there is some sort of um, lower limit to the rotation, how is it? upper limit to the rotation period. So that at some point uh, stars do not spin down more. At least that's what this tends to suggest. This could also be just that at some point stars stop having spots and therefore you don't see them rotate in the Kepler observation. So uh, when stars reach a rotation period of 30, 40 days they do no longer have spots but they could still have plats and facula. Uh, I don't know of any stars that have, have firm detection of rotation period much longer than 40 days in photometry, but, but when we go to the S-index, there are a few stars. And this brings me back to the AK point Vitense uh, diagram. So the suggestion was that when, when we are looking at active stars that have a magnetic field that is dipole dominated, we know from observations of, from Fairborn Observatory that these stars are also mainly spot dominated and they're also the youngest stars so they obey the Schumann law. And then my suggestion is this mimic the sun doing solar maximum, grand maximum. If we go over to the inactive sequence here, uh, the stars in this picture would be dominated by a quadrupolar magnetic field we know from the observation from Fairborn Observatory that it would be factorly dominated and uh, because they have a quadrupolar magnetic field they will have no or very little magnetic breaking and this would mimic the sun doing amount of minimum. So this had been into this figure, the equipoint potential diagram have been uh, inter interpreted as sort of an evolution figure of stars so stars start out here, rotating fast, being very active, and then at some stage here, they make a transition. But it could be then that the sun is, is like constantly transiting from being very active to being inactive, together with a, a number of other stars. Um, and then that the main part of the stars here on the inactive sequence would actually not show spots uh, but they could, of course, still show uh, plas and facula, and that why, that's why we can, reserve, we can observe rotation period when we look at the chromospheric emission. Good. That was what I had to say. Thank you. Questions? Um. First of all, I'm very pleased that you used in the very beginning of your talk a figure from a paper I published 40 years ago showing the high resolution calcium 2 spectra. So thank you for showing it. Um, I really like what you've done, but I'm concerned that you're dealing with very low signal to noise data. And when you're dealing with low signal to noise data, then um, 
systematic errors can creep in and other effects and instrumental effects can creep in and be important given the fact that the signal is so low. So I'm just wondering whether the scatter, the large scatter that you're getting in some of these diagrams that you're plotting may really be an effect of systematic errors creeping into low signal to noise data. Okay, the, da the uh, spectra obtained also include the calcium to infrared triplet lines. 8498, yes, yes. 8542, 86, which have much, much higher signal to noise, but of course they're a little bit less sensitive to the uh, activity in the star. They're sensitive, but not as sensitive as the calcium H and K lines. So my question is, or you know, I would encourage you to, try to do the same kind of science that you're doing with the H and K lines, but do it with the infrared triplet lines. And you're going to see filling in as for the more active stars. And it may well be that the higher signal to noise in that data set will overcome the lower <coughs> sensitivity of those lines to the um, chromospheric emission prop and activity properties. Thank you very much. It's very, a very, very good idea. I don't know why I haven't thought about that. But that's, I mean, sometimes it takes long to get this good idea. But sure, obvious. That should be fine. Uh, you commented a number of times on the large uncertainties in systematics in the effective temperatures from the Kepler input catalog. Uh, don't we have uh, good spectroscopic effective temperatures for all these stars now? No. No. Uh, we have updated values from Daniel Huber, who uh, collected a large amount of spectroscopic values and then use that to sort of recalculate the, the effective temperatures from kick. Uh, and uh, I, I tried to use the new values from Daniel Huber. I mean, unfortunately, very few of these uh, stars that I'm looking at have spectroscopic values. That would be the best to do. But, but it changed very little if I used the values from Daniel Huber. Just a comment about that. So we're providing a new Kepler catalog star properties, so maybe that will improve some of them. And actually, I'm using some of the most t uh, effective temperatures for these stars, so maybe you already have them. I don't know. Uh, it's only 6,000 6, red giants that have new t effective temperature from most, And we also have Apogee uh, effective temperatures. So Isn't I thought there were many main sequence stars that have uh, effective symmetry by the most, but um, they were well, yeah, they have both, but mostly red giants. Okay. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, I also have a comment about previous comment on the um, um, rotation. Uh, your plot of the S index. With the rotation period, where we yes, were comparing yes. the Nielsen and uh, Macquillan, um, so I think another issue that could be that could explain the differences is that when you use the periodogram, you also have issues of getting half of the real rotation period, because if you have spots on both sides, then you will measure half the, of the rotation period, which you uh, get rid of when you use the autocorrelation. So that can explain that. You see a better trend uh, with the Macquillan. Could we move some of these stars? Yes, yeah. and move them to yeah. twice of the rotation period. So. If you look back at the Van Sater's work, um, we actually do suggest that the loss of spin down is caused by the loss of the dipole in the magnetic field. So I don't think that's mere speculation. And there, you'll see in there actually citations to the literature where simulations have been done to demonstrate this with, with the Kowaler mechanism. Well, okay, no, no, I'm, I'm not saying that, that this is only here, yeah, but, 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 but uh, and, and I, I, I like the, the line in there in, in the Fantasios, and I haven't looked at the reference, I'm sorry, but, but, uh, Do they discuss this thing about? No, this is new. Yeah.
So, okay. uh, a comment on style, namely, I would really encourage you to not make plots of light green against a white background, or even worse, yellow against a light background. I do have a, a former student who really enjoyed making plots of dark blue against a black background. So that's probably even worse. So how about dark green against a white background? Yes. So I have a comment and a question. So first of all, the what's the typical number of measurements per target of the S-index that you have from Lamost? What One, yes. So you have all of the rotational scale and cycle scale variability in there, which for active stars can be about, on the cycle scale, about 0.1 in S, which could move it everywhere in, in your diagrams. Uh, so if you would, hopefully there'll be more data coming, and then that problem will diminish. Not for from the most, no. OK. Uh, I mean, the, the, we were discussing if we should try to go back to the Kepler field, but I mean, there are also the K2 fields now that are interesting to go for on the test uh, observation and stuff like that. So I don't think that we will come back to that. But that's, I mean, I should have said that, that this is, most of these are signal measurements. And that, of course, explain why uh, I cannot see uh, this relation. Because into this plot went a number of, of decades, years of observations. Decades. Yeah. Uh, where, where you can then take the mean or the rotation period or a cycle period in some cases, and then you can get a much stronger relation. Yeah. And then one observation. So it, go to one of your histograms of the uh, DS index. And uh, does it seem surprising that the, the peak of the S index in the Kepler field aligns with the sun's? range of variability? Why do, why do you think that might be? Um, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I mean um, of course, uh, the most have not observed the sun. So I need to trust my calibration to other surveys um, when doing this. Uh, but, but when I do this as careful as I can, Yes, then they line up. So. Travis, you said it, they chose to expose pixels to sunlight stars? OK. No. Uh, and of course, I mean, I've removed the giant stars here. These are all main sequence stars that I look at uh, with temperatures below 6,200 Kelvin. Yeah. But your, your question, uh, I mean, you addressed that a little earlier about several uh, if there are multiple observations of the S-index, and uh, you talked about some of them having overlapping fields. Yes. So there you effectively do have several observations, but what's the time between those? Are we talking days or years? Uh, where was it? Sorry. Uh, yeah. Um, so, the Kepler field was observed with the most over three years, okay. where the main part of the observations were done uh, during the last two years. So you then have two observation seasons where you observed for a week time. Uh, so for most of them, it's days. For some of them, there might be a year apart. And for a very low subset, there might be two years apart. So but, but yeah. Uh, and of course, the ones where I have multiple measurements, I simply just take a mean value. But it's too, I could actually look at the ones with multiple observations and see if, if I mean, you would increase the signal to noise, of course, so you would expect to see a stronger correlation there. Okay, I guess we're about out of time, so let's thank the speaker. <laughs>